A little bit on, on uh, Conway. Conway is really three different companies. Uh, two are, are trucking companies all over the United States and I believe Canada. But uh, Menlo Logistics is the area that really works in terms of uh, warehouse management and integration. And when I got involved, Menlo Logistics had, oh, I'd say about 800 people in their IT department. I think they're a little smaller now. But uh, very, very complex custom software development that interfaces with their clients so they can take care of uh, warehouse and transportation and their clients don't have to. So a little bit about Lean. It was two, it's hard to believe that it was 2006 and, and I got a phone call from uh, Menlo. They're in Portland, I live in Portland, and uh, they said, uh, we got your name, uh, we know you do Lean IT, we're interested in Lean IT, would you come over and talk with us? And it was myself and my business colleague, Steve Bell. And we went over and we, uh, we sat down and we talked. And we ended up sticking around for about 18 months and helping them with their lean transformation. Uh, the company is still going strong in terms of, of, of lean. And it was really the IT group that set the stage for their entire corporate campus. So it was leadership in IT that uh, really brought lean to, uh, to that whole area. They had used lean in the warehouses, but there was nothing in the office. And it was really, it's one of the few examples I know where IT was leading the way and setting the, the standard for the rest of the, uh, the company, which was very impressive. Another uh, key ingredient was the fact that when we got there and they said, well, we'd like to do uh, lean, uh, can you run some Kaizens? Can you train our people? Can you start? We said yes, but only on one condition. They said, what's the condition? They said, we said, we want to develop internal lean coaches. We called them lean facilitators. And we said every team would have an internal coach. And the reason we did this is so we didn't create a dependency on a consultant. That's, you know, I know that sounds ridiculous coming from a consultant. But it actually, it's, if, you, if you work with a consultant and they don't talk that way, get a different consultant. Because you don't want a dependency where, well, Mike's gone and now we can't, we can't do Kaizen, we can't think on our own, we can't problem solve, we can't use A3, we can't value stream map, that doesn't work. So uh, we set that up, we started with, I believe, 12 core people that were enthusiastic and wanted to be lean coaches, lean facilitators, that proved to be key. Because as we scaled, and we had, oh, 25, 30 Kaizen events going at the same time, the only way that that could be supported is if they had internal coaches. There's no way two outside consultants could have done that uh, and, and kept going. Check adjust along the way. We started and we, we, uh, we had some basic tools, of course, in A3, uh, but we had several adjustments. We found that certain areas of the business were not ready. They did not want to uh, go on the lean journey with the rest of us. And I remember uh, Richard, the vice president, said, what should we do about those groups? And I said, nothing. Go with the groups that want to do lean, start there, and then lead by example instead of trying to force people. The other thing we did was we created something we called a continuous improvement roadmap. And each manager got to identify their lean projects that made the most sense to them. And that was very important. We also standardized a lean communications board. The one thing we did that changed the game, totally changed the game and got everybody on board, we issued a charge code for Lee. Because the IT staff said, you know, they ha I have to be billable. You know what a charge code is. So once we got the lean charge code, people started getting involved. It was like magic. Last of all, the, gl the glass ceiling. That's what Mark is going to talk about. I was talking to, uh, to Richard one day. He, it was about two years into the lean journey. And he said, I feel like we've hit a glass ceiling. And I said, what is the glass ceiling? He said, we've done all the point Kaizen we can. 
we've had about $3 million in productivity gains, very significant, over two years. But we haven't done any system Kaizen's, where we're looking at the value stream. We've done point Kaizen's, where we've looked at a single problem, like a help desk, or a server deployment, or a security issue, point solutions. But we haven't done value stream solutions, and we now need to move there. He called it a ceiling because he said it's a new level of understanding, and it's a challenge for us. So one of the things they wanted to do was introduce value streams, dedicated value streams, separating development and operations. That's where Mark comes in. Mark's a leader on that team, has gone through the transformation, and we'll let him tell the story. So um, what were the challenges we were facing? From It's kind of five major areas, from our external business partners, cost and delivery. I'd be surprised if anybody is here who has not heard the statement that IT costs too much and takes too long. Uh, anybody here? No? So we heard that a lot. We, we're here. We had a very complex cost structure, um, often bore no resemblance to the monthly IT service costs that our um, operations were receiving, um, and bore no relation to often to the size, complexity, or volume uh, that these operations were supporting. The, around the delivery uh, aspect, we, we did some cursory analysis that um, showed that our enhancements, which we define in Menlo terms as projects that were less than 400 hours, um, were taken, had lead times of anywhere from 22 to 34 weeks. So, and also of those projects, we were struggling to meet our dates, which further led the business, uh, gave the business the perception that not only did IT cost too much, but they also couldn't deal. And we had a, a disconnect on our budgeting. Our operations uh, were budgeting at, the, at an IT at a variance of plus or minus 10%. And the budgetary standpoint for IT, we were at plus or minus 25%. So we, we had a, we had a out, of, um, out of sync. The other area uh, around that was quality. Um, Operational and system uh, improvements were always uh, deprioritized in favor of customer, billable customer work. When we had um, system downtimes, our root cause analysis documents or RCAs were either incomplete or non-existent. And we were never really getting to uh, the root cause of our problems. And also, some of the Projects that we were introducing into production had a higher level of defects than we were deemed acceptable. And also, we did some, again, some analysis by value stream mapping within the, some of the functional groups who had support organizations in them. And it led us to believe that our, our lead time or non-value added time was significantly longer than our process or value added time. And the analysis came up with roughly in the range of 16 to 20% of, uh, pro, of lead, uh, process time. So that was a, a, pro, a factor. Um, from our internal voice of custom, which was our employees, we had way too complex an organizational structure. Too many moving parts, too many handoffs, uh, too much waste. Um, we had much, multiple functional groups with competing projects and competing demands. And resources were being bombarded from all sides with project work and being pulled off and over into support work. The last one in this, uh, all these things culminated in an uh, inequitable work-life balance for, for, for our employers. We were, they were telling us it was a stressful environment. Um, there, was, there was too much uh, resource burnout on startups. They're usually sold up front in the sales process with a date before we know the size and complexity of what we're delivering. So they would... Um, need a high level of uh, overtime, uh, long hours, weekends to deliver to this day, and resources were starting to burn out. And from at that time uh, period, we were seeing a lot of new customer startups, so they would roll right off one startup right onto the next one. So, And the, the worrying factor that we saw there was we started to see a, a higher than normal level of uh, turnover. Although some level of turnover within an organization is healthy, we were starting to see key employees start to either leave or make uh, voices that they were looking elsewhere. So, so what did we do 
to, um, to change this? Well, I think uh, Mike mentioned Ri Richard Carroll. He was in, uh, initially brought lean into the Menlo organization, and he had this idea of a focus factory concept that we could separate out the production and support type work from the projects and enhancement uh, project work. So we deemed this, uh, ended up with them calling these the value streams, and the goal was to start to address standardization and flow and start to remove some of the waste um, in our inher inherent in our existing processes. So what was some of the expected improvements? Um, reduced cycle time. Um, again, we believe that if we could focus the resources on um, starting to address standardization and flow in the project enhancement work uh, value stream, that we could start to take some of that waste out and start to cut down our delivery time to the customers. Allow better cost isolation. Um, we, we're trying to give transparency to IT costs, and we believe that this would help us do that. Um, we had, like I say, a very cost, complex cost structure that business didn't understand. So on the projects and enhancement value stream side, we, we moved to a blended hourly rate that accounted to recovered all of the cost of the resource within that value stream. We, this would include not only salaries, but travel and training, uh, communication expenses, computer expenses, whatever cost followed the resource. On the project, oh, sorry, one thing it also took into account was our internal tiered rate structure, where you may pay $75 an hour for a lead engineer versus $25 for an offshore engineer. We had kind of a selfish motivation um, by doing that because we wanted to negate the uh, business trying to direct where the work was done in an onshore versus offshore model, and also who worked on their projects, a lead engineer at $75 an hour versus an engineer, say, at $50 an hour. What was our implementation approach? First, we took a deliberate, uh, this was the direction of strategy was done at a senior management level. Um, when we kind of walked through some of the, how we were gonna do this, we rolled it out to the, the management level. It's a deliberate approach, so we, we explained to them you know, what it was we were, we were doing, and more importantly, why we were doing it. Then we talked about the, this focus factory concept, what it was, and asked them, you know, could, it, could it work in our environment? And if, if it could work, how could we make it work? And then we looked to them to provide feedback. And then we documented the value stream owner role. We believed that there was a necessity to have somebody be accountable for the value stream. We deemed it to be a part-time extra credit assignment, um, that they would be responsible for the costs, the capacities, and the, and the results of the value stream. That they would own the uh, CIR, the uh, Improvement Roadmap for the, the value stream, and that they would um, collaborate with the managers within the value stream on things such as value stream sizing, um, cross-charging, um, rotation within and out, in and out of the value stream. And then we uh, started to, once we had the alignment of the management team as a whole, we started to talk about and look at the structure of the value streams. How should, it, how should we structure it? How, what would be the roles and responsibilities within the value stream? How would we handle cross-charging between the value streams? Should it be a brick wall between them with where we limited the cross-charging, or should it be more open and allow to cross-charging. And then how would we, our implementation and rollout plan, how we were gonna look, how we we're gonna address that. And then we socialized uh, with team members and listened to some of their concerns. So I've heard a lot of that in some of the speeches today. Um, I've been asked a couple of times by people about that. And we, we knew that there was gonna be skepticism. Um, this, was this gonna be another change? So. We've put lean, and we're doing this lean thing, and now you want to change it all and go to these value streams. So I don't know many of you, um, back in the 90s, we had total quality management, a very similar kind of concept. We put, a, as an organization, we put a lot of money into this. Um, we hired the equivalent of a lean sensei. We did this for a couple of years, and then it kind of faded away. So it's the same kind of thing. Are we going to make another change on top of many of the changes that were happening within the organization? 
So there was an inherent skepticism uh, around that. So anyway, um, sorry. So then we took some of that feedback and held town halls where we invited everybody to it and we addressed some of the concerns. And some of them are up here. Co-location. Um, the management team were very... Um, we thought we could get a lot of value by co-locating the teams together, especially the production support value stream, so that they could start looking, sharing the knowledge, looking across, collaborating across the teams. Um, this didn't go down very well with our employees. They believed that they had more alignment with their home teams, that they could function just as well staying where they were. So initially, we agreed we'll take that off the table uh, in favor of kind of a war room situation where we would, you know, as an issue came up, we would pull people together in a war rooms type situation and, uh, and then knock that out, and then they would go back to their own respective cubes or whatever. Uh, production support seen as low-value work. This is, I don't think, unique to this organization. Production support is often felt as the low-value, uh, less creativity, um, less reward. Uh, the, pro the guys on the projects and the startups, they get a party when things go, they go live, and we don't get any of the accolades and acknowledgement that, that they get. So, And then the suitability to smaller teams. How do you take a team of three or four people that has key resources in it, and every team has their go-to guys who are required for all the project work that goes through, and similarly, when a production support issue occurs, they're pulled away to solve that. So how is that going to work in these small teams to separate out a resource and you know, isolate them, for example, in the support value? Uh, some of the results that we've seen, we, we believe we have a much more streamlined organization breaking these resource streams apart. We've seen a lot of collaboration, knowledge sharing, both within the value streams across the functional teams and also across the value streams. Um, we've seen a lot less of the issues that we were trying to address around the resource thrashing, the no longer are res resources being pulled away to, for support work when they're dedicated to the projects that they're working on. And we've allowed some of the, you know, it's allowed us to, to start standardizing on tools within the value streams. Um, and if you see the sales to startup uh, arrow in the top left-hand corner, this was an initiative that had started a couple of years earlier, and the, the goal of this was to create a framework um, to deliver new customer startups all the way from the pre-sales outside of IT all the way through to implementation. So they, they focused on developing common tools, templates, processes, and when the value streams uh, came about, this kind of they fit very nicely into this uh, existing framework and were able to leverage some of the work that had been done and the templates and the tools and the processes without having to go through that process or, all over again. Um, key role, uh, the value stream owner. Um, we didn't formally put that in place in the beginning and we saw um, re the results of not, make, of not doing that. So this uh, role, which I am one of them, uh, provides the leadership and the direction for the value stream and also the accountability. So just as the resources within the value stream, including the management layer responsible to me, then I'm responsible for the results of the value stream to executive management. Transition duration. This was wildly underestimated. Um, I would never have thought that we, uh, we're still, uh, it almost like, seems like we're not much further than we were before. We are a lot further than we were before, but. Uh, I never thought it would take this long. Um, and one of the, I think one of the key factors was the reliance on key resources. So every, project, every team has their key resource. And when you start to separate out the resources into these value streams, it's how long it took to impart that knowledge that these guys had in, for example, the support, the resource in the support value stream so that they could work independently and autonomous, autonomously um, without the reliance on these key resources. So that was a, a big issue. And the big picture understanding, that goes back again to why do we need this change? Most of the resources, uh, our employees, get their view of the health of 
the organization or whatever based on their functional view, whereas management is the bottom-up approach, whereas management's lo more looking at a top-down and seeing more holistic uh, view of some of the issues. So, And employee engagement. We've been through at least two, if not more, plateaus during this time. Um, how do we keep people engaged in, in that process? Um, they, again, it comes back to skepticism. I think the initial skepticism fostered a, a wait-and-see approach. So we'll wait and see how those guys do. And if they're doing OK, then, then we'll jump on board. Um, and the other thing was, it was this was a management-directed initiative. And as soon as you label anything as a management-directed initiative, you get pushback. So um, although. In actuality, it was a management-directed initiative. We took great pains to paint the vision, paint the, the direction we wanted to go in, and then turn it over to the, our employees to drive the bus in to, in, towards that destination. So, but it still had that management in, moniker on it. And finally, the um, lean is always, the leanish part is always looked at as not as important as the real work. You know fixing the problems in production of, and doing customer billable work. So how do you keep, you know, trying to keep that as a, on equal level with all the other work is, has been a challenge. Some of the ongoing challenges, um, this perception of administrative excess, we hear this all the time, is it takes too long, there's too much paperwork, you know, why do I have to do all just to a simple change? Well, we have moved more, a lot more towards the daily Kaizen, which we, kind of denote as anything less than eight hours. But we're more, in, more trying to get the, the lean thinking, the lean process there, and, and not have to burden the resources with A3s and CIRs, and save those for the bigger, hairier issues, cross-functional issues we're trying to address. So we'd like to get to a 90 to 95% daily Kaizens, and maybe a 5% 10% for the more bigger structured Kaizens that need the more formal approach, documentation, things like that. Uh, low hanging fruit, well, everybody knew, uh, it was visible to many people what our challenges were as an auto IT organization. So when we brought about Lean, it was um, easy to go after those things and the difference that I saw with, with Lean before was everybody knew it was out there. What Lean brought was a structure, a methodology, a process, a thinking, and more importantly, management support to go after fixing some of these issues. So there was a lot of excitement because we started to remove and make improvements in some of these areas. But soon, that low-hanging fruit was gone. And now we're finding we have to delve deeper to find uh, improvement opportunities. Management has a lot of work to do. This is extra credit. Um, and so if they're not engaged, their employees look at them and go, well, why should I be? So, you know, again, it's, and also giving, instilling in the managers to give their employees um, the support in way of the time to do this and to make it a priority to do lean work and not just um, as a fill-in or don't load the resources up with 45 hours of work and then expect them to do five hours of Kaizen work as well, so. That's the end of my presentation. I thank you all for attending.